to uncertain things we decided kind of on a whim to have uh, another cross-section conversation with our friend and favorite ex-evangelical misha thomas hey hi misha hey how are you we, okay. we have a bu- we have a bunch of guests that we're really excited about coming up in the next few weeks and but none the, more uh, than misha <laughs> none more than misha uh, but most of them are going to be surrounding the issue of the election and how we're gonna be picking ourselves up as a country together afterwards well not all of them we have at least one musician ahead but I thought that this is a good time for another cross section another postscript uh, cross section with Misha to kind of digest some of the things that we've been talking about and prepare ourselves mentally to the nightmare that the next couple of weeks are bound to be the night so, before, nightmare before Christmas coming our night, way the nightmare before Christmas <laughs> yeah, and, and today is is Halloween, right? Today's act- no, it's not. No. Uh, uh, next Saturday. Oh, too bad. That would have worked. I always think that it's on the same week as my birthday, but but no. it's not. No. It's not. It's not that serendipitous. So, Misha, h- how have you been? Uh, well, busy with work, but good. Uh, how are you? How are you keeping yourself mentally stable ahead of the elections? Wow. I mean, as a mental that, health care professional, this is a loaded question. That is, I mean, I, I, I'm sighing. I, I, in a way, I can't believe that's the first question because that's a really risky question right now. Because I'm actually, believe it or not, like that's a question I've been dreading the past couple of days because, um, Because of how I voted yesterday. <laughs> Ooh, you've already voted. Oh. And so it's so it's just I, it's just a it's it's unusual for me to be, you know, a little afraid to talk about something. But uh, yeah, that that question immediately gets to it. Oh my god, there's like so much tension now. Like, oh my god, who did Misha vote for? It's kind of funny. Like, who knew that this would be the topic? Like, you know, before we talked about, like, oh, how fun! We'll just you know we'll chat about things, and I should be careful not to like impose my current crisis over the election onto this conversation we'll see if it comes up and i'm like oh no this is your first question so. and i assume just by your reaction that you voted um as as some people say voted dangerously M- maureen dodd had a, had a book of all of her um 2016 columns and i think it was called the the year of, of voting dangerously so i guess i guess this is the real year of voting dangerously for misha yeah i mean this is this is i voted for trump And the thing is, it, like, I'm shocked myself in a sense. And so, like, the whole, this idea that we're talking in the context of uncertain, I'm like, oh, yeah, whoa, this is great. Like, that's that's a good platform for me right now, in a sense. But I'm shocked. So I'm dealing with, like, the shock for myself. You know, I can't tell you how many times I, like, screamed. I would never vote for Trump. And then I would say whatever I wanted to say about Trump. And here, indeed, I voted for Trump yesterday. And I was, I was sure that I was going to. I'm glad that I did. And I'm, you know, I'm sticking by that. But I'm still dealing with my own shock for having done something so counter to what I thought I would do. And in addition to that, I'm dealing with, like, just to be honest, the fear of coming out, not that I have to, because I could always say, oh, it's none of your business who I voted for, which tells you that I voted for Trump. But I'm dealing with the fear of coming out in a way that I haven't felt and feared since I was young, gay, and in the closet. I mean, it's just really kind of surreal. I'm like, oh my goodness, I haven't felt like this since then. And I'm literally, even though it, it feels irrational because I don't think this will happen, but I'm actually feeling like, oh my goodness, am I going to lose my family and my friends and maybe even some potential work because of this? Mm. 
and I, I need to say that we did not plan this. I no, had no idea. I had that no a, idea. <laughs> I had no idea that you a voted for Trump and b that you just voted. So yeah. I really it wasn't even an intentional trigger. And now I'm I'm very glad that I dragged you here for this conversation. Oh uh, well, okay, good. Well, hey, at least I don't have to feel guilty of like you know sort of bringing up my issue on your talk. You know, you asked the question first. It was the honest answer. And and I um. That's so wonderful because I was thinking about wanting to. Vanessa and I were talking about guests in terms of diversity, and Vanessa uh, puts a lot of emphasis, rightly so, on on diversity of of walks of life. So it's like from age to 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 gender to um, race. And I was thinking that I really don't think that we'll ever be able to capture the window of. Um, full diversity of opinion because I couldn't think of any Trump voter that I thought could bring up a conversation that I haven't heard before that's worth inviting on the podcast for this reason. So that's that's actually very it's very kind of you for taking for filling that slot. Well, you're welcome. You know, <laughs> you know what's interesting? My sister. So I mean, I only had a couple of conversations and. You know, the first few were really good. You know, it's like, okay. It was kind of like when I was coming out. The first couple of times, like, okay, this isn't bad. You know, I'm not getting rejected. Well, the first sort of tough one was with my sister. And this, I have two sisters, and this is the one that I'm really close with. We talk all the time. And her reaction was strong. I mean, it was like, what? You did? What? And then, you know, she went into all of the reasons why one shouldn't and i could see that she was working really hard to be like you know the loving accepting sister but of course i could sense all of the intensity in her tone but what she said that fascinated me and i'm thinking about it because of what you just said she started describing like the quintessential trump supporter or at least her bias of that and she was like yeah and they think and i was like wait a minute but that's not me and so like that conversation made me realize wait a minute you're not hearing me i'm not declaring myself a Trump supporter. I'm telling you that I voted for Trump in this election. So that distinction is very clear in my mind, but I don't think that's the presumption of how someone's going to take it. <laughs> you know? I, I, so in a minute, we'll get into how, like what you had in your mind when you were voting for Trump. And I, I keep delaying that point because I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm holding off the satisfaction because this is this is too interesting for me. I'm not going to talk about who I am going to vote for, but I can say that it's not going to be Trump. And I can say that I have had conversation with people trying to dissuade them to some extent from Trump, not to push them into other candidacy, but but specifically with a phenomenon that is Trump. I do find it to be. Um, especially corrosive yeah, um, you for, know, I, for society. I, but, I, I'm, but I'm not going to make my case. So this is I not. Tell in, you one quick thing. I, I have written enough about the topic in my share of opinionating publicly. I just want to say, say one okay. thing. I really do envy you in a way because, like, re what really, what I really wanted was to do a write-in. Like, I want, like, like, like that's what I thought I was going to do. Like a month, maybe two months ago, I thought I'm going to write someone in that really represents like an ideal. And then, but that's not what I did. You know, I, I did something that's practical and, and other things as well. But like, I envy that I didn't, I envy you in a sense that I can't say, oh, well, I wrote this person in. I think what I did was harder for me. And um, so, you know, here we are talking about both my conviction about that, but also just the honest vulnerability that I'm feeling about it. Mm. So before getting there, again, keep holding off that satisfaction. I don't mind. Uh, withholding <laughs> it. It's my heart rate to come down a little bit. Well, can I just quickly say that, I mean, I still love you, Misha. I still accept you. Yeah. I am very shocked, though, and I am process. Yeah. The reason I'm going to probably be quiet for a little bit is that I am processing this. Yeah. Um, so I, I, it's going to take me a little bit, <laughs> a no, bit to come fine. back. V Vanessa also <laughs> will probably not vote for Trump. This election. Oh, I have well, voted and I have not voted for Trump. Uh, so you have voted. Getting, yeah, I'm getting uh, I have I mailed in my ballot and I did not vote for Donald Trump. Okay. Correct. Okay. Uh, also, interestingly, well, there's so many things that this opens up. There is, um, well, uh, the whole question of we're we're two of us at least are journalists, and there's also always the question of should journalists even talk about who they voted for? And yeah, sorry, I, it, I just I, you can see how how clearly I consider myself a quote no. unquote real journalist that I just well. put out on the line right there. <laughs> um, be that as it may, I do think that 
um, there, there has been, there have been some people who have been making the case that this should be something that people should feel more comfortable talking about, yeah, whether or not like, um, like, they choose to do so should be up to them, but they should not feel that there is a danger of being penalized by doing so. And also they should not, it should not necessarily mean that their reporting is compromised because we know that reporters vote. We know that they have their preferences and we still trust them to do their best. At least some of us do trust them to do their best um, to, to, to get at some core. I don't want to use the word truth, certainly not big T truth, but at some truths, um, being compromised by whomever they 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 put on a ballot. Yeah, th- so, I mean, that's that's close. That's close and kind of maybe almost right. But I think no. I think we. Sh- I think this is a great opportunity for people to start talking about it because it counts now. Because when you have loved ones and friends that are shocking you with their choice, we should talk about that because I think this is kind of the point. We are where we are now in our divisions precisely because we haven't developed because we haven't practiced the really hard stuff of having like these tough talks about politics. Like what good is it gonna do like for my sister to say, okay, fine. We don't need to talk about it. No, you can't like, like you do the way the conversation. And she said, no, 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 you gave me your reasons. I understand it. That's good. You know? And it was like, whoa, no, like let's eventually come back and both admit that it affected us in a difficult way, but we're okay to be on this, you know, developmental journey that involves civics. And I'm like, oh shoot if this opportunity is here now because of Trump and how divided and how scary and messed up things are, then good. Like, let's practice it. I I, actually, I 100% agree with you on that. That, that was in fact um, my point. And it's just reminded me that there was a whole uh, to do about reason magazine kind of outing what their uh, writers and editors voted for. And with a, with a bit of a blurb explaining their, their perspective. And they made a point of publishing an article. Here's how reason voters, sorry, how reason editorial staff has voted it, it exactly in order to stick their thumb in the eye of buttoned up pseudo objective mainstream media institutions, New York times, the institution, which we know is false and, and unattainable. Anyway, I think that it, it, we should preface by saying that all three of us are in New York yeah. and we're voting in New York, which yeah. means our vote, unless there's going to be some incredible upset, matters very little. Like the, it's yeah, a foregone great. conclusion, not even just for the presidency, like all the way down the ballot, it's probably a foregone conclusion. That's right. That's right. Um, I, I just read an article about despite being one of the most expensive races in in history the like so what, what, so what, what was the okay here's that here's the game i just read an article about one of the most expensive races i think in history i don't remember the time frame but an extremely extraordinarily expensive race which 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 one do you think it is one of the most like notably expensive races this year oh, the, the georgia uh senate right. no the ocasio cortez Oh. race the one that there is no doubt that she's going to win wow. that she's there's no there's no real competition and there is really no um polling showing that she's in any danger but because she's so symbolic that, that so much money was put into dethroning her mm-hmm. and so much money was put into preserving her incumbency which is just tells you how stupid things are like you know ocasio cortez is like the 1000th most powerful person in the country maybe less like she is like she, her power is so insignificant in terms of actual yeah. um policy the, getting policy through but she's such a symbol yeah. that this is where people she are flocking. social power social influence yeah i guess yes and on both sides she's a socially galvanizing force for yeah. the right as much as she is yes. for the left or, so i would even say more so probably <laughs> right. kind, kind of like trump like uh, for a lot of trump yeah. supporters of that i know and and now we'll, we'll soon hear misha oh who is not a trump supporter but a trump voter for a lot of trump voters trump is an option that you accept it's not necessarily some people obviously you you have the total the full MAGA crowd you have the the full Gorka MAGA crowd um that that see Trump as the epitome of manliness and and muscular governance but for the most people who vote for him he is and I've, I've been talking to a lot of people in in swing states and in Virginia um in the past couple of weeks and people who had no doubt that they were going to vote for him 
but who are not happy about it. And they're not, see, they, they, they are as repulsed by some of his behavior as other people and as worried about some of his policies as other people. Yeah. But they still see him as the, the right option for them and they just accept it. Whereas for the left, I don't think anybody is just is just like, you know, mildly upset with him. It's either you are full on enraged and like fire breathingly enraged by him or you're you're or that's it. That's that's basically yeah. the only option you have on the left. OK, so monologue aside, our vote doesn't matter. We're in New York. Why? No. When did you realize that you're going to vote for Trump? Well, I, um, I'm itching to get to another question, but I, I'll, I'll try to answer that because I think it's interesting. Um, it was within the last week, but where I really started experiencing it, you know, there's all this, I mean, I don't know. I, I know I'm going to be paralleling my coming out experience. And I, it, it should be interesting psychologically because, you know, one might say, oh, perhaps he's projecting too much of that experience onto this. So who knows? I'm open to that. But I remember like the early stages think, oh, I think I might actually do this. It was my really taking in the hearing for Judge Amy Coney Barrett. Something about that process really pulled together what will become, you know, the reasons that I am going to give for voting for Trump. Um, so that's sort of the timeline. But can I jump back to what you're saying here, this point you're making about all of us being in New York and how that vote, in a sense, you know, doesn't really count. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting because even though I did not consciously approach it in this way, like I'm imagining either someone else doing this or like if, if I step outside of myself and do the kind of like, you know, psychoanalysis that I love to do on everyone and everything, you know, I think there's a case to be made that, oh, look at Misha. This is Misha doing what he does. You know, he's the, he's the ever actor taking on the position of the other in this experiential way. Like he's becoming the other as a way of really learning it. And that is sort of very me, right? Like I believe in that. And it's like, wow, there's a sense in which I can afford to do it. So someone could critique me and, you know, say, oh yeah. So he gets to do this like dramatic, deep experiential feeling of the other side and, you know, garner all, the, you know, harness all the sort of wisdom and insight from, because like, it's New York, you can afford to do this. You know, it almost reminds you of someone who's like really rich and they want to, experience what it's like to be poor. So they rough it for a month and write about it. It's like, you know, it's almost like there, there could be a case to be made about my doing this. Oh, you could afford to do this. Whereas could you imagine if I were in like a real swing state where every single vote counted, the fact of me doing this would be even more poignant and riskier. Mm -hmm. So I don't and, know. And, and it would be it aware. less, and it would be less liable to the accusation of being a performance yeah, right now right. you could say like you're being a trump voter yeah. as a performance or as a statement it, whereas exactly. then it would that statement would have you know country if not world shaping consequences yeah, they'd be like dude you are the one whereas here like a few of the people that responded to me were like oh well you know people need to do what they need to do but if this were not new york they'd be like oh my gosh do you know what's on the line so anyway i'm open to like thinking about that myself. Now, having said that, that doesn't make me, you know, second guess that I did it. I'm just like, wow, I am aware of that. But if I could talk about that a little bit, I'm like, oh, the experiential part, it's like, yeah, I actually am experiencing that. Like just in one simple way, I mean, I be, okay, so I'm okay with being aware of my fear and sensitivity and, you know, the fact that, you know, I too, it doesn't matter what other people are going to think. But you know what I noticed? Like, as I was thinking about, gosh, how honest am I going to be? There was a part of me that got really defensive. Now, never mind that I wrote it out because I thought, I'm so nervous. And I really mean this. I was so nervous about this. I wrote out the reasons for myself and I folded it up and I took it with me as I walked over to that impossible, like, two hour line. Mm. And I, I mean, I'm not going to show it to anyone. It's not going to say, look, here's five million three. But it was for myself. One, because I thought, I mean, it's almost like a psychological ritual that you do in behaviorism. It's like, okay, Misha, this is your plan. But if you get overwhelmed by fear, lest you forget, here's what you're committed to. That was the purpose of me writing this. Um, but guess what I noticed? Like afterwards, 
when I was anticipating someone reacting poorly to me, be it like my friends or my family, I was actually already getting kind of nasty in my mind. Like I was, I was already coming up with things with, oh, I don't want to hear this pompous. And I was thinking, ah, maybe that's what like the typical Trump supporter is doing. Like, never mind. Like, they're not going to be talking about their vulnerability or how they're afraid of this. They're just going to say, well, screw you. You know what I mean? And then there's this upswell. So, there, so I'm just saying, I can imagine, I'm not saying that I'm the authority on it because I'm experiencing it, but I can imagine that that's how it works. There's a kind of weariness. Like, I felt weary even before having any conversations. Like, I talked to like two people and I was already like weary. But now I look back and I think, I wasn't weary. I was afraid and defensive in advance. Look, I uh, two weeks ago, I interviewed somebody who runs the, I don't remember the name of the page, but something like Pennsylvanians for Trump uh, website or, or Pennsylvania Women for Trump, something like that. So clearly I'm interviewing her as somebody who is, you know, running a pro-Trump, Trump, a, lot, a pro-Trump campaign in, in Pennsylvania. When I talk, she spent the first 10 minutes of our talk justifying herself to me yeah as somebody who's calling from new york she's like and and it wasn't you know a rhetorical game trying to to drag me to her team or something um she just took for granted that being a trump supporter is something that you need to constantly justify obviously we have MAGA people who are proud and loud and some of them even extremists it's the same way you have in both sides you have really wild people on the fringes willing to do really horrible things but, and this is the mind boggling yeah, part, you have a lot of normal individuals and that's something that constantly needs to be qualified. People who, who constantly feel that their, their uh, alignment with, with the, pol- like the, their choice of president is something that they need to um, um, answer to. I don't, I, don't, I, don't yeah, I, I just, I don't, I don't think that that's like, this is, we're not talking about a regular no, no, no. here okay it's not like you're talking to a um you know pennsylvania women for ex republican like, yeah. like they wouldn't feel the need to justify that just because we, we are of new york and we are That's therefore of the left like this is not a normal candidate and these are not normal circumstances i, I almost feel like of course she has to justify yeah, right. herself. I'm, okay. that's true I'm with you on that. If I get, well, two things. One, let me say, really, I mean, this is so great because I mean, I mean, none of this was planned. I feel the love, seriously. And like all of the, all of the principles around safety, I feel so safe with you guys, like having this conversation. Let's get on to the fun part of like debating and arguing. Seriously, because that's all anyone really wants. It's like, like if the safety weren't there, then the debates and the questioning seems, you know, unfa- I don't know. I, I, anyway, I, it would I, devolve. I, it would devolve quickly. It wouldn't anyway, be. So a I mean, it would, be, it would become Twitter. It would become Twitter right. audio. But, but I guess what I want to say is, I fully appreciate the sensitivity and respect and all that. But don't feel like protective of me or anything like that. It's like <laughs> that's the interesting thing about admitting vulnerability. Vulnerability doesn't mean you're fragile. You know, it just means like, hey, there's an aspect to it. And I, and as you know, I love the debates and da 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 and all that. So and great, great. I take that as permission to stop being your defense counsel, and yes. we can get to it. But one other thing, can I jump on with Vanessa? Like the most painful part of the conversation with my sister today. I mean, it really was painful, and I didn't let this on. We hung up the phone, and I later thought about it. And she didn't mean it to be painful at all. I just said something about like how I wrote out, and she, why did you have to write something out? Like, why did you have to do that? And like, what she meant was like, yeah, why? Like, if you're voting for him and you know that you, why do you feel the need to write it out? Like, to, to, to defend it to anyone? And I was like, whoa. Like, that pierced me in the way, like, I'm not even really sure, but it's like, there's a part of me thinks, yeah, like, do I overly care about what people think? Or like, should I have to come up with my reasons ahead of time? So there's a part of me that's thinking that. But Vanessa, I think you just helped me with like another aspect of it. It's not just like fear and all that. It's like, this is like, it was so difficult for me. Mm -hmm. And I think the choices were so impossible and so bad. And our government and everything is like so messed up in a certain sense that I needed to write it down. And I needed to come up with a set of reasons for myself because it's that dizzying. So I love that you make it clear that nah, it's not just like you're doing it for emotional reasons. It's just, it's hard. It's a complicated thing. 
No, and Vanessa also emphasized the point, which we will get to that, and I actually agree with that. It, I don't accept Trump as just being another option. It's like, right. and, and moral equivalency to bad politicians and Trump, I think, fail on several levels. Yep. And we'll get to it. So, reasons. What what around the Amy Coney Barrett? And I assume it's not just the no, ACB no. hearings. It's no. it's it's something. It must have been something that has been brewing for a while. So okay, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna read the first like uh, like bold thing that I wrote in my little sort of letter to myself. I voted for Donald Trump as a matter of his official influence, not as a vote of confidence about the contours of his personality. Now, isn't it interesting that that's my first point? Because that's not even really like a reason. But it's, it's basically me saying, I know, like I'm already anticipating that all of the reasons why I should not vote for him are because he's just corrupt and he's a liar and he's untrustworthy. And all, all of those things are so compelling and indiscriminate. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, be- before you go further. That's it. So, so, because so, because I'm now dropping the 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 defense attorney. So, um, yeah, um, um, the uh, I encounter a lot from people I know who support Trump. Some of them are not even eligible citizens, um, or even in America. But I know I've heard arguments, um, for Trump from from many quarters, and I have also heard many anti-anti-Trump arguments. And the most common anti-anti-Trump argument is, oh, you're just responding to his personality, which I think is is total bunk. Um, especially Rich coming from um, from the party who who impeached Clinton because he 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 got filleted in his office and made a whole to-do about that. But well, you know, hypocrisy aside, the the problem with Trump is not just his personality, it's certainly not for me. And I don't think that, and, 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 and even in the beginning when there was a lot of fuss about about uh, the, the way he speaks or, or, or the fact that he's, he's so happily slaughtering some of the sacred cows of American conversation, I was, with that, I would be fine. I, I even supported, to some extent, some of those impudent, insolent, sacrilegious postures that he take and gestures he'd make. I do not think that's the same thing as corruption. No, corruption you know and the contours of I personality agree. are not the same thing. Corruption actually has impact on the function of a government, on the way that institutions work, on the money that we all pay in taxes. And now I'm not saying that necessarily that's his true. corruption is, is, is unique or not unique, because there's a whole discussion there, but corruption is not the same thing as personality. I agree. That Hey, I take that as a good, that's a good editing note for my, for my revision here. And it really is so good. But it helps me also to clarify and say, ah, I hear what I'm saying. This is the first point, which, by the way, we can jump past this and really be, get into the substance. But I guess, this, I guess this is my first point is my way of saying, please listen to my reasons for voting for him rather than not hearing what I'm saying, because you can't fathom me somehow looking past all of those things. Mm. That's yeah. what I'm saying. But like, hey, you should say, okay, go get on with it because I don't have that problem here. So I should really get on with it. Seriously. I mean, it's so cool. Like, because with people, I don't know, you don't seem to be saying that. So let me give, uh, let me give. I, I mean, I, I appreciate it for, for some, some, for a listener who might be concerned about this. I mean, but- I, mean I would be, con- I, the thing that concerns me in this realm is I wouldn't call it personality so much as character. So I'm yeah, assuming Misha, that you're saying, let's put character aside for now. Well, I really don't want to say that because character matters, but you'll see in the rest of how I'm contextualizing that his character does not, supersi- does not supersede our checks and balances and our separation of powers. And that's really where I'm going here. Like what I'm arguing in a sense is we overinflate, like our reaction against him, which is all justified, we are inflating the actual potential that all of that has to destroy a system that has, even whilst he's been in office, functional and strong and still in play. And so that's, you know... If, ah, I, I, I can already see materializing in front of me yeah. the, the, the fallacies of your argument that I will be latching on to. <laughs> oh, good. No, good. Let's, but but I, will, I will let you lead us there. In by case the way, I'm I know, that I, and I want to hear that because I know it's debatable, and I know that it's going to, it's hard. It's going to be a hard thing for me to even like hold together. But in the end, I do believe 
that character matters, but it just so happens so far that his character flaws, such as they are, which are also deplorable, they still do not disrupt the sphere of influence that he has that would be lost if he doesn't have another term. You get me? We'll see. Okay. Right, right, right. Yeah, this is, I need to be, I need to be, this needs to be explained to me further. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, but this is, this is hopeful because I, I, I think it's going to be hard for me to get past that point with, with a lot of discussions, but let me try. Um, also, we can come, come back to it and you can take us. No, there's another, your, no, I want to sit the, the big, the I don't part. want to do the little, I mean, I'm tempted to give like the little, like, uh, he did this, he did that, but I don't, I don't want to, I want to stick with the macro first. So here's the big macro thing. I think the most precious part of our system, and you're going to see the influence of the hearings coming on the, the Barrett hearings, because this was such a good focus that made me think, oh yeah, wow, this is what I love about our system. Like I, and this is me saying this, I'm not quoting anything I heard directly. It's just though it influenced me. I think that the most astounding thing about our system isn't really the constitution because like uh, the constitution has to still be interpreted and all of this. I think it's the separation of powers and the checks and balances. Like that is what is just like so precious and has to be preserved in our system. Mm -hmm. So in that, what I'm really against, like my criteria is I want to vote for the best balance against an over concentration of power and the irony of this is that it's trump it's like why should this madman like trump be the person who represents this for me but indeed he is compared to biden i think trump getting another term provides the republican check on what i think is the potential of there being a, a tilt, an over-concentration of power grabbing from the left. And I fear that the movement that the Democrats and the left are going, it's away from a functional separation of power, checks and balances. And it's almost moving into, uh, I mean, I don't want to use the word fascist, but like, I'm kind of thinking this, it's almost like, it's not just, this is what we believe, this is what we advocate. This is righteous. This is just. This is what has to happen no matter what. And if you're not doing it, you're part of what needs to be overturned. And I'm thinking, whoa, that's not separation of power and checks and balances. That's an all out like war to win and defeat. And so ironically, Trump's the president who has had one of the most effective and profound checks on that side of power. And I think it's important to have another four years of it. Can you explain when you're saying the, the, the power grab of the left, can you explain, can you describe yeah, and give, give me hear. examples of, of that and, yeah, the, and the ways that Trump has checked it? The simplest example I think is both, like, like the attitudes and the reactions around the Supreme Court. So in other words, so long as it seemed to be tilted toward the left, then we think that that's right and that's just and that's, we're happy with that. But now that it's tilted to what seems to be, it's going to be tilted to the right and conservative, we don't see that as, oh, wow, that's just like, that's a political law. Wait, wait. So, so I, I, to to um, elaborate on that. So, the what, what you're talking about is when you're saying it, you mean the reliance on the courts to resolve public issues, right? That's Rather right. than on the just or the fact that Roe v. Wade um, was a matter that was decided by the courts or or gay marriage. The fact that those were things that were not decided by lawmakers, but yeah. by a court that established the law of the land was fine you're saying but um um for for you know democratic sentiment or liberal right. sentiments now that the makeup of the court is shifting clearly and and one-sidedly then, then according to you you're seeing you're seeing a willingness to to break the system or and to be specific the talk is you know Not we should court. grab power we should expand the courts or yes. we should like put term limits or we should change the system in a way that will that's exactly ensh right enshrine so, example, our power Absolutely. in the courts thank you for that that's exactly right so, 
So in other words, when, when gay marriage became the law of the land, I was celebrating, like I was in the West village, like dancing in the streets. You know what I mean? It was just like, yes, this is good for the country. Now there were a lot of people that were unhappy with that because it goes against their beliefs. It goes against their political views, but guess what? That's our country. That's the democracy actually working. So here's my question. That's a win for our side. And by the way, I'm the other thing that's hilarious about this. I'm left. Like I'm, I'm liberal. I'm left. I just am like, you know, I take any political test online. That's where I end up. Um, so it's like, that was a win for us. But here's the thing. When we have losses, that isn't, that's suddenly not part of the system. It's now time, like, like we have to more than protest against it. Like we have to force getting our way rather than conceding and practicing a kind of political tolerance that is written into our system of checks and balances, separation of power, like all of that. And so, so I just think like, because Trump, and I don't wanna just blame him, but the Trump era has stirred all of us up around all types of injustices, but it seems to me that Biden and the left, where we are now, we're going to go in a direction that deepens the disruption and the destruction of system because we're saying everything is unjust, like the whole thing. Like, I mean, you know, it depends on. Yeah, how- but, but let's be clear that Biden has been very um, um, uh, well, it wasn't explicit. Biden was equivocating on the question of whether he will support court packing. But it seems to be very clear that Biden is not on board. Okay, right. This, but this is so let's be. Book. So so when you're talking about we, who's we? Yeah, I know. I know. It's fair to... And we're talking about the left and the Democrats. Remember that there is clearly a civil war within the left, fair which enough. is actually much more prominent right now or, or playing out much more effectively than the one on the right. And the right, there seemed to be a, a, a moment of a potential civil war between the Trump crowd and the you know old school character matters conservatives. Exactly. That war was decided basically the moment that Trump won yeah, but here's the, how, the candidacy. But here's why it was decided. And the, the Republicans were actually kind of brilliant about it. They hated him too. I mean, I'm serious. They're like, come on, like, just, yeah, no, they and they still do. And, and, and now that they're 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 thinking that some of them think that he might lose. You can see how people are distancing themselves right. from him. And, and obviously, if he wins, they will rally back. This makes my point. This makes my point because let's say, well, it, ma- it makes it wins. To, to be clear. Wait, wait. To be clear, what point it makes because I, because there is a subtlety there. It, okay. it I'll, shows I'll, you that the the, the people that the, the Republican Party politically savvy that it is, knows how to uh, circle the wagon. That's the right. left the left, is incapable of doing that. The, the, you know, the self-devouring that's nature of the point. left is the circular firing squad yeah, is, a is a feature of the left since the concept of left existed, basically. It's, it's, it goes back to the, to the French Revolution. The left is right. its I, I own. Mean, and it, it, it's already eating Biden for not clearly st- t- taking a stand pro court packing and that's because biden being a traditionalist being an institutionalist and being in his millionth year in politics he he's not so keen on seeing the the system change so radically no he's, he's not, not but guess it, what here's the problem the problem is he like trump first of all trump i don't think he has he doesn't even have a philosophy or anything else he just does what's going to be like to get him to win and so the republicans knew that so basically, Trump is just the, I mean, what term? The, the vehicle. He is he, the vehicle. Right, that's it. He's the vehicle. The Republicans said, look, if we're going to get anything that we need in here to actually get some footing against like the Democrats and the left just winning, every, like they're winning the gay marriage, the health care, everything. We've got to like get this guy to be our guy. And that's what we've done. He's, but exactly. Ah. That's, that's exactly a case where it shows you the difference where the left will not necessarily be able to do that with Biden because Biden does have some principles. You could okay. say that he, so you he, he's a right. politician. You could say that he is corrupted by the system by being an institutionalist, which is a fair argument to make. But, you, it, but, but he's not the same as Trump. He's not an empty vessel I for, take the, that. for Mitch McConnell to fill with his wet dreams of heritage foundation approved judges. Look, I hope you're right and I'm wrong, but just to be clear, that's my answer to Vanessa's question. I, whether for right or for wrong, my vote for Trump is a vote against my fear that Biden and Harris will be vehicles of this opportunity. I don't want to just say left. It's an opportunity that is very seductive to like, I think the whole country. There's an opportunity where it's like, hey, we have the best excuse possible to demand every issue of justice we feel because Trump has facilitated it. It's like, 
yes, all protests are on. And I'm thinking, that's a little too much for my taste. And I'd rather see the GOP have a little more steadying power through our nut job president. And that's why I voted for him. Wait, can I ask a question about, because um, something that I, I don't quite understand is that the example that you gave about the Supreme Court, it, it's about it's about conversations happening about ways to limit the power of the Supreme Court because things aren't going our quote unquote way and our, right. I mean, like people of broadly of the left. Right. But I, I, I've only seen on the right, they're not playing by the rules. I see gerrymandering. I, see, I think of yeah. Merrick Garland. I think of all the ways in which they are very... Uh, and there's a lot of evidence for the ways in which they are attempting to exert their influence in a way that makes that subverts the checks and balances that you're talking okay, about. So, that, so this, yeah, okay. explain, Misha, explain. So, I mean, the, all of those things, all of those things are corrupt and all of those things have to be changed. No, wait, wait. So I just I do want to answer that specifically for for accuracy. It's like Mary Garland yeah. and even gerrymandering is not not playing by the rule. It's literally playing by the rules. Actually, yeah. It's just exploiting the rules in, in an anti-democratic way, with, specifically with gerrymandering. As our conversation. Um, so what's so week, bad about so amending everybody does and that. changing rules as opposed yeah, to exploiting that's okay, them? Good. Right, right. That's that. that's the question. I'm, look, I'm glad you're saying that. What is so beautiful to me about this conversation and oh, my goodness, like, I'm so lucky that you're the one. Oh my God, this is perfect. You can see you're asking and pointing out the right questions that are almost impossible to hold in your head. Like if you, it's like, so anyway, your question makes it clear that my vote isn't on the substance of what's wrong with everything. My vote is so narrowly focused on just the practical role of this office. Like someone has to have this office for four years. But I, part of what I'm saying is, look, my vote does not presume what I fear, the majority of our country presumes, is this overinflated role assigned to the president. I mean, we have been asleep. Like when you talk about gerrymandering, how many of us even know about gerrymandering? How many of us are upset and ready to go protest in the streets about what's been happening little by little with gerrymandering? Like, we don't even know what it means. Yeah, he, Arnold Schwarzenegger is really worried about gerrymandering. He should be. But what I'm saying is I'm saying that I haven't studied it because why it hasn't, you know, there's been no, re like if I, if I watch a video of someone being killed on TV, that's enough to stir us up. So wait, wait, so your excuse for, it is not excuse, <laughs> but your argument for voting for Trump is the ignorance of the American people? The you know, civic wait, oh, ignorance of the American I, people? Yes. I mean, that's my second major point in my little paper here. <laughs> I mean, here's the way I say it. And you can laugh at it if you want to. <laughs> what I say in this section is I say there wait, is... Wait, if, I, 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 if, if the argument is as follows, one of you or share with you uh, is going to buy me, uh, you know, some, some fancy cocktail. Oh, yeah, this will be fun. What do you think I'm going to say? <laughs> That Trump as an antibody response created more civic awareness yeah. and civic participation <laughs> of the kind that has been suppressed by the current state of American education and the numbing prevalence of cheap entertainment. Is that is that something? Am, am I am I in the neighborhood? You and I talk too much. We're <laughs> <laughs> We are friends. Weaseling his way out of this cocktail. We <laughs> are friends. You know me too well, but yeah, that's basically true. But let me tell you what I wrote. You say but I am getting the cocktail. You're going to get a cocktail anyway. But the, what I wrote, like the heading, the heading for this section is called, there is a wisdom of crisis and insight that is available within the Trump moment. And then I go on to write about how <clears throat> if we vote, <clears throat> excuse me, if we vote him out, the, the, like, you know, the triumph of getting rid of him, I think will lose this moment of us really self-reflecting. It's like COVID. Like COVID is giving us, in a sense, the opportunity to sort of reflect and regroup. But let's say it goes away, like really, really soon, which I hope it does. Will we throw away all of these like insights of value and what we needed to get right? Will we throw it away? I don't know. We shall see. But that's, you know, there's a whole little section where my thinking is, Wow. Like, and I don't mean Trump deserves to win because, oh, wow, we're extrinsically getting wisdom. No, what I mean is to react to him without looking in a mirror 
keeps us from changing ourselves. It's just, it'll be too easy of a victory. It's almost like, no, let's struggle a little more with the Republicans attempt to make good sense out of having him as a leader of your party. That's, that's what I mean. And I voted for that. Well, for, okay. So I don't think you need me to spell out the problem with your COVID uh, analogy, right? We, we, we are not, nobody, yeah, sure, course, yeah, we, might, we might have as a society learned something from COVID. <laughs> Nobody's going to vote COVID into, for another term. Yeah, <laughs> we, that breaks down. I know the analogy breaks down, yeah. So they're just, just putting this out there. Um, <laughs> but it's a good it analogy. Because COVID it's 2021. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I mean, the analogy breaks down, but actually, look, I'm going to go back for a little bit. The reason it's a good analogy is because that's my way of affirming, you know, the horribleness of Donald Trump is not lost on me. It's not like I'm like, oh, I'm a supporter now. It's like, nah, it is like a virus. But guess what? And then I'll finish my argument. By the end of the conversation, you will need to answer the whether or not you would have still voted for Trump if you were voting in, you know, Bucks County in Pennsylvania. Is that, is, would you? Yeah, I think I would actually. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so, so you, you, you spared me the, the question. Yeah, I would have. I mean, I mean look. No, I'm, no, 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 but I, I, I want to stick on, on, your, on your previous points. <clears throat> this was, I, I, thought, I thought you might need some time to think about it, apparently. Vanessa's, Vanessa's question, I mean, I like it. I like the whole. No, I, so I, I want to ask you about, or, or not ask you, or challenge you about some of the things that you said. Okay, so first, institutionally, you're voting Trump in, or you're imagining Trump as a bulwark against democratic overreach. The way I'm yeah, seeing it right, right now, uh, it's not the, you <clears throat> might have, Let's separate the cultural influence of Democrats, or rather of the left, which is something that I take very seriously. And let's separate that. Make sure that it's clearly separated from political power. Because politically, Democrats are are, are in charge of one half of the legislature. And that's it. Right now, they and they, less they have than lost a half, the court. as we've as we've witnessed again and again. Yeah, and they've lost the court. They've lost the the presidency. Yeah. Which and by all rights, the get, regaining the Senate is is more of a more of an uphill battle even than the presidency. So the chances are that if Trump wins again, Democrats are not winning the Senate, and even if they do keep the House. That still means that we're st- where we are today, and maybe even maybe even more f- like further right because Trump may get to um, appoint more judges. You know, I know. J- 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 <laughs> yeah. Justice Stevens is not is not is not a not a spring chicken. Yeah. We are in total Republican control over federal power. Culturally, it's a whole other matter. But I think this is a sleight of hand that a lot of people on the right are doing in trying to conflate the cultural impact yeah. of some of the m- more extreme parts of the left, w- which I am often against. Like, you know, um, just, just today I was re- reading a Slate article that, that, that the headline of it, and if you haven't encountered it, like, let, let me, let me uh, share it with you. Mm-hmm. It's something like, to solve racism in c- classical music, <laughs> stop referring to composers by their last name. As in, you know, the, the reason that there is racism in classical music, which is already a premise, you know, let's just, let's just accept that. That is because we're calling Beethoven Beethoven and not Ludwig van. <laughs> it's like this is the sort. This is content that gets mongered on on in the cultural circles with with a lot of cultural currency and and dominance. And it's ridiculous and it's emblematic of a certain state of mind that is disgustingly elitist, disgustingly disconnected with some of the deeper problems, and also has a lot of censorious implications in the way that it shuts out conversations that 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 challenge this hegemonic thinking of of what 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 matters and what doesn't and there's a whole and and, and just the other day like we got into a conversation with um, one of our flatmates about the importance of uh, of uh, cancel culture and whether whether it's a thing and whether it's a thing that we should worry about i am on the lo- on the side of it is a thing we should worry about and one of our next guests has written a whole book about why you should be worried about this 
And as somebody who believes that by definition to be a liberal should mean protecting this kind of free conversation, I'm appalled that it's up for debate. So there's a lot to say there, and I say it, and I, I am on that train. I like All that. that is in the freaking cultural bag. The cultural bag doesn't change electoral result, does not write laws. The cultural bag does not um, start wars. The cultural bag does not decide foreign policy. And the cultural bag does not decide on Supreme Court cases and adjudicate matters of life and death on that level. So as much as I am very vehemently opposed to the asinine argument that Cancel culture. Oh, who cares about cancel culture? Who cares about whether or not you're you're able to publish a Tom Cotton op-ed in the New York Times? I was like, okay, fine. This is not the same as no, the presidency. This is not the same level of power as the Senate. Let, let's, but, let's, but that's uh, important for Misha to comment on because I mean, I I agree with you with you here, but clearly Misha's seen some sort of existential threat coming from the left, which see, he seems to be locating in in the political sphere, not just in the cultural sphere. It's such a good, I'm, I'm just mostly contemplating, but I have, I have a couple of things to say about it. The first thing I'll say is, let's just, I want to go back to the Supreme Court for a second and say what I think is great about having someone like Barrett on the court. And by the way, I say this as a pro-choice person. She's pro-life, clearly pro-life. She's a woman, Christian, pro-life judge who's going to be on the Supreme Court. And it's kind of like, only in America. Like, that's so great. Like, what a big win for, like, conservatives and women and Christians. It's like, they get to see their block up there on the Supreme Court, too. Just like, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg represented that for so many people who were against that. And I'm thinking... That's a good thing for our country. Like, yeah, it is opposite of what I'm like for, but isn't that like, that's a good thing. So that's one example where like the reaction to people like, and you see- It's a good thing because you have a character that um, embodies those contradictions or embodies the the complexity that that you don't have to be pro- That's true for Choice as a woman. throw Throw my values to the side. I'm talking about written into our system. It's a good thing. Like- E pluribus unum, baby. It's like written into our system. And I go back to separation of powers, checks and balances, and like the, just the, the democracy. The fact that you have disagreement, that there is a civil process that mediates that disagreement. And what I'm saying is the fear that I have, and by the way, the fear isn't the fear isn't like apocalyptic. It's just that I have to come up with some factors that's going to make me pull one lever over the other. And the lever for Trump is because I do fear that the direction of what is the Trump backlash, like, you know, what's going to happen post Trump with the Democrats, is that we are going to be less amenable to the actual process of our system because we want to win no matter what. It's not, it's not about the process, it's about the winning. And I'm saying, hey, if we have a pro-life a Christian on the Supreme Court and that tilts it conservatively, democracy is working because guess what? They're having their day. And you have to practice being a good loser just like you have to practice being a good <laughs> winner. And we're losing that with the democratic backlash. Good, and, good losers, good losers like the Tea Party in 2008, right? No, they're not my good, example either. Right, but my example so, embedded within my principle, not within the. So, no, right, but 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 you have to think about. Oh, you don't have to, obviously, but I can't help but think about how I realistically imagine it playing out. Neil Ferguson, had, the historian, had a yeah. argument. I remember uh, soon after Trump was. Um, not just elected, I think it was after the inauguration. And he had the argument that I thought was bullshit when he made it. I, I, by the way, I, to be clear, I actually really like Neil Ferguson. I, I read yeah, uh, a bunch of his books. Like- He's fantastic. I thought that was a bad argument. Yeah, his argument was that the, um, the Trump's election is going to be a, a pressure valve that's going to release all the tensions that have been accumulating on the losing side since 2008. They're going to feel... 
v- some degree of vindication and it will be catharsis it will be the the orgasm that they were looking for yeah see, I don't, I don't. and we can come back to some some degree of low tension normalcy a i think it's clearly that's not the case because you know the, the four years of his presidency and the way that his supporters and his opponents have been acting out in those four years prove that it it, it was wrong do you think that by another Trump presidency, the left will be placated? Do you think that it will? Mm, now's the time for some soul searching. No. And in fact, well, I hope in fact, in, in fa- uh, well, yeah, but in what it will more likely tell them is, remember when conventional wisdom was that we should put a moderate as a candidate? Remember when all political experts were telling the hyper enthusiasts of the far left that they should be holding their noses and put their dreams on hold, and get behind a Biden. So we heard groans and people shaking their fists. But ultimately, for the most part, people kept quiet about their opposition to Biden on the left. Definitely more quiet than they were in 2016. So what do you think is going to happen if he loses? Are we going to see a more tame Democratic Party? Is the left going to be, huh, that experiment failed. Maybe we should be more moderate. Maybe we should move deeper into the center. No, this is not going to lead I know. to well, more soul all the, searching. You know all the more reason why I need, all the more reason why I think we need Trump to win so that we can all go back and maybe experience the defeat a little more realistic. We'll experience the defeat and the left, the voters on the left, even some moderates are going to say the DNC has failed that's not my again. primary. That's not my primary argument though. I mean, like I, I like the argument, but that's not my primary motivation. Like that, that didn't make my little list at all, but I don't mind talking about it. Like I want to go back. Okay. So the question about culture versus policy and all this, guess yeah. what? This is kind of fun. I want to go back to like the last podcast talk we had. Mm-hmm. When we were talking about the image of God, right? Like, it's fun to go back to that. And, and by the way, I guess I should preface this by saying... Oh, it's just, I, I do, I want it on the record that clearly Misha is implying that Trump is the image of God. That's <laughs> no, I'm not. That would make my own point. But, what, but, but I should preface by saying, look, like, when you talk to me, it's true the way you did in the introduction. Like, I'm... I'm going to be. Wait, this was this was a quote for the for for posterity. It was it was a joke. It was, it was I not know. serious. I will, it was okay. Straw manning for. Uh, <laughs> I love you, Misha, and I don't think you admire Trump. Okay. I know. But I'm such a philosopher. Like I'm always going to be like sort of the philosopher theologian, and like I think that's fine. Like that's my contribution. So it's like I'm always going to be thinking about like sort of like macro and big. But I realize in the discussion, gosh, wouldn't it be fun? if I actually had expertise in my policy. And it makes me think, I wish like, you know, I mean, it could be a fun experiment. Like let's have like a super, super scholar who like knows everything about like civics and policy because it would be fun for them to like both challenge and support the macro philosophical stuff that I'm like really strong and clear on. It would be good for them to like put the minutia and the details to it. Because I can't do that. Like, I don't have the knowledge. Like, you know, I mean, I, I probably know <laughs> more than a lot of people on just the basics of civics, but I'm not like a policy scholar. So here's where I'm going back to the stuff that I'm comfortable with. Like, big philosophical themes. When we were talking about religion and the image of God, remember when I said, like, and this goes back to my whole thing about the politics of friendship. And I talk about Jesus, talking about loving your enemy. You know, the way I interpreted this literary myth was to say, oh, there's this theme in the human experience where if you eliminate the need to destroy your enemy, then you're forced to collaborate in a way that actually changes both of you as an alternative to winning and losing. And I guess what I'm saying is my vote is a ritual toward that ideal you know, rather than my vote being the upholding of a dogma ideal. So there is no God in my political ideology. There is no right party or doctrine. There's just enemies of sorts who, if we can replace the idea of destroying one another through votes or all these victories, 
the impasses, and this is, why, this, by the way, is what I think is the brilliance of our system. I mean, maybe it was accidental or, hey, maybe the History Channel's right. It was like aliens who inspired the founding fathers and made them do this. I don't know. I mean, I'm joking on that. But my point is how brilliant in retrospect that they created separation of powers and a check and balances that forces our impasses to change ourselves. And so what I'm saying is I don't want any side of the revolution to win because if that happens, the opportunity for creative collaboration is destroyed because of the triumphalism of partisanship or something like that. Now, that is an idiot. That's, that's like, that's my ideal. Like, you know, we were talking about what I love about the image of God is like, oh, it's like sort of the restoration of ideals over winning and losing. And like, so my ideal is an ideal of a politics of friendship where you not letting me exactly win what I want forces me to change a little bit so that you can change a little bit so that we make it work. And who's, want- who's a better avatar for the policy of friendship and reaching out to the other side than Donald Trump? <laughs> This, this is what I'm thinking in my, in my mind. It's because I'm just I'm just thinking I actually watched the debates and like how many times did Biden say like, you know, I I've I will work with the Democrats. I will work with the Republicans. With the I will reach yeah. across the aisle. Um, I will you know, I've done it in the past. I will do it again. Um, and you can you can think he's lying, but that is in theory what he's trying to stand for. Especially if our conversation is in the realm of cultural influence, at least Biden and Joe Jorgensen, the libertarian candidate, both of them are very clearly on the side of, if we're elected, we'll be all America's president. Yeah, we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll be reaching out across the aisle. We'll be trying to bring this country together. We are the candidates of whatever, whatever cheesy line you're going to feed not, them. Yeah. And whereas Trump... Is almost as explicitly as possible states that he is only the president of the 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 half of the country who voted for him. But that's why I go back to my. He is the New York who didn't vote for me can go f itself. But it's California can go and burn. And so he to remind you and and don't think about the policy decision there. Think about just the symbolic gesture when California. Re- applied for an emergency status for the fires that were raging there for weeks and months, Trump rejected it. He said, you don't get any I know. emergency funding. If in the right county in Pennsylvania, some coal mine had collapsed at the same time, you just know it would have been declared a national crisis immediately. The fires were not. And later you had to... Take it back and and actually send some funding. Yeah, I mean, it's, but originally he said he de- he will not acknowledge it as a crisis and will not transfer funding to an American state of forty million people that was being consumed by wildfires. That is again. Don't think about the policy. Think about the gesture. It says one of the most populous states in this country. Millions of people are not. I do, are not represented by me. I, I am not worried about their lives and their homes and everything that they care about, their landscape. They can go burn. That is what this president stands for. Well, get ready because it, this is actually really good practice and we can replay it when Trump loses. Which I don't think he necessarily will, by the way. Well, I voted for him, so I hope he wins. But if he does lose, you know I'm going to be doing what I'm doing now for the next freaking four to eight years with the Republicans. I, I do know that. And by the way, I did it for Bush. Like when George W. Bush, whom I hate, like, I, not him, I didn't hate him. I hated his presidency. And I think, oh my, George W. Bush. I remember sitting out at Fire Island with all my fancy, gay, liberal, New York City, fabulous friends. And like the way they spoke against him, like I was saying basically the same thing then. And during eight years of Obama, I was basically doing what I'm doing now, like some version of it. And and wait, Misha, just to be to be clear, you don't owe us any explanation to defend in in defense of yourself. You are not under attack. No, I don't feel under attack. I guess why I guess why I'm saying that. Look, I want to be clear. I'm not being defensive in that sense. I guess what I'm saying is 
I agree with you, but and actually, and and I don't again, I, I want to reiterate that actually, a lot of your your points, I really do agree with them, and I agree that there is an excess of militarism and almost a militaristic ecstasy on parts on the left. And I do my share of haranguing about this and writing about this, and I bring guests on to talk about this. I just don't see Trump as the remedy. And there not was, the I'm remedy. Not... Remember, just to be clear, from my first line about official influence rather than personality, although I should have said character, it's not like I don't I'm not voting for Trump thinking that he as a character or leader is ushering this. No, in. but this is this is the, the okay, so, so this brings it's the check on power that I'm voting for. I'm voting this for this brings us to the other question. Yeah. You're talking this is the, that I was uh, holding off on. First, where there are the areas where the presidency does matter. And it's no longer yeah. just symbolic or a yeah. uh, uh, check against power. And for instance, signing off um, um, emergency uh, funding for states in, uh, in trouble. Problem. And and let me let's think about the the what, what was what happened after the the hurricane in uh, and the floods in Puerto Rico. Yes, Those are people's lives. You know? That's no longer culture war. That's not you know the, oh the the left was pushing to just throw money at Puerto Rico. No. People, including Republicans, were pushing to send emergency funding to Puerto Rico when thousands of people were dying there. Okay, so and the me, president me, was, ah, they can't vote for me anyway, essentially. So what I'll say, what I'll say to the right. And, uh, no, and I want to expand that. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, for, I like for, it. For monologuing, because it goes, okay. it, this is for um, uh, the lives of Americans, um, like whether they can or cannot vote. But why can't we? But there's also, but there's also the global scene there's also the global theater and to be clear i think some of the things that his administration has done internationally have been successful the middle east peace accords i think they're broadly speaking a good thing i think some of the fu transmissions that he's been sending to the eu i think that's not that's not necessarily a bad thing in certain circumstances in fact, some of them are good probably. and i think that the fact that he cre- he drew more attention to China, to the imminent Cold War. I think that's a good thing, even a very good thing. So and those, he has done things that are beyond the symbolic that are important, and, and I don't, I don't want to take reform, it away from him. Prison reform and African-American colleges, which I'm excited about, but it wasn't on the top of my list, but there it is. Uh, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get there. I just want to say that all that, uh, I, the, I complimented him on the international stage to, in order to, to, to cut him down as well, because I think that what he's doing in terms of the way that he is showing the world that the United States cannot be counted on in the way that he is showing allies that the, the the American presidency is an arbitrary and fickle force that isn't bound to any agreement or commitment made by a previous president that feels free to completely ignore previous obligations to show that we are no longer willing to play any any moral role on the global stage. I think those are detrimental, it's not just to American supremacy, which I is which is a thing I support because as, as hypocritical as the United States has been historically and has devastating and has been in in certain parts of the world, I think that on balance, it's done it, the having it as an internationally stabilizing, albeit hypocritical force, is a good thing. And I would rather see it maintaining its supremacy than, than it going to tyrannical, theocratical places like Iran or China or Turkey. Yeah. So he, what he's done to undermine this order, the order that was originally created for American self-interest so that America doesn't have to constantly jump into wars around the world, what he has done to undermine it is lasting lasting damage in my opinion yes <clears throat> these are areas where the president is truly not symbolically relevant it's in ter- determining who gets emergency funding it's in determining foreign policy maintaining relationship with allies and standoffs with enemies those are things that on a whole he's done lasting damage in my opinion and in, in, in he will do more in, I, in, I suspect if we elected. No, I'm not, I'm not interested. And by the way, I think this might have been more of what you were anticipating me, to, what I was going to say when I was talking about like the wisdom of the moment. But I'm not interested in blaming the victim ever. But can we all like share 
some responsibility for the risk of these trends? Like, why must there be a reductionist culprit like the president? It's too easy. Like, why can't we say, whoa, Trump is a wake up call for all of us? Like, whoa, like, like him being so erratic shows us just how unasleep we must all be for all of this stuff. And again, I'm not blaming the victim, but I'm No, wonderful. It's a wonderful point, actually. I don't... I, 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 that, no, I agree with what you. What I'm going to say, that, like next year, when like if Trump wins, I'm going to say to the Republicans, say, what did you think? I'm going to be like, what did you think was going to happen? Like your extreme right revolutionary spirit, it pushed us to everything that you're seeing now. And they're going to say, well... The well, the left was always Obama. that bad. Yeah, exactly. that's I, exactly. no, I completely agree with you. And that's why I always push against the left. That's why um, me and Vanessa's partner keep having those sparring matches about cancel culture and why I say that it does matter that the left is behaving like assholes. And it does matter that the left is espousing um, censorious approaches and, and radical uh, institutionally undermining approaches because it it leads to the pendulum swing wider and more dangerously and 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 actually cr- puts a, a crack in the establishments that have been holding this country together so i'm completely with you on that and i will never say and i don't think at all personally that a lot of the damage that Trump has done internationally is solely his fault, nor do I think that the the damage that he's done domestically is his, domestically is his fault. I think that there is um in years long trends um of ignoring both in terms of economic disparity and in in international facetiousness and 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 callousness that have brought us to this point. yeah, I do think that it does matter. Where you may, where you stake your official position, and Trump's position is anti-democratic, illiberal, pro gangster regimes, and self worship. And we must all respond to this some kind of way by refusing to play that game and to continue it. We must replace it with what is already written into our system which is a system of collaborative struggle rather than winners and losers. I guess I'm, I'm struggling to, to understand this, this point, Misha, because I, I, from what I'm, from what I'm hearing from you, it's like, we need another term of Trump because we need to collectively suffer. And through this suffering, we have to come out on the other side as better, better informed, more collaboratively minded citizens. Um, And so I guess, first of all, I don't, I don't quite understand that premise and why you think that that, if I'm reading it right, why you think that 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 the Trump presidency is the best way to get us there another four years. And on the other hand, I just really, I really can't wrap my head around the stakes of that. Like, yeah. I don't think it's, I think it, it, it's, it feels almost too intellectual and yeah. not grounded yeah. in the reality of like, yeah, we all need to be better humans and we need to be more civically minded. But the fact of the matter is most people can't get food on the table and mo- most people don't have time to learn civics. Um, yeah. And, and it just feels like the, the, the stakes are too high to say like that, like the price to say that that price is willing. We can pay that because this is where we need to go as a country. Yeah. That's so good. As usual. I mean, it's like, Oh my God, Vanessa, you're scary good at the way that you listen, because like you give me chills. I'm like, Oh gosh. Like she reflects, like I am kind of saying that. And it's so scary in a way. I don't know. Okay. So let me struggle through it. Cause it's so good. Um, yeah, I am kind of saying that, but not as an ideal. In other words, like I'm not glorifying suffering in some kind of dogmatic religious way. You have to suffer to be, you know, purified or something. No, I think that we've been avoiding the suffering of this as our reality for a long time. And it's just incidental that Trump was the one that sort of facilitated the shifting of the consciousness. So in other words, it's like, so long as like Obama's in there and, and, and before him, like Bush and Clinton, the economy, like whatever, like whatever was going on. I mean, obviously I can't reduce all of those years with a simple statement, but like it's, it's as if where was, okay, I'll, I'll, I have to go back to COVID again. Sorry. 
like I remember when we were experiencing all the uncertainty around COVID, it was because like we were forced to, like people aren't working, people are dying. You're hearing sirens every day. And I remember having like this sort of philosophical contemplation. I thought actually life has always been like this. It's just like some of us now are forced to reckon with it because situationally we can't be in denial about it. Like life is always uncertain. It's always like kind of rough and kind of good, you know, but like a crisis really forces the point. So I think Trump as a crisis gives us a chance to see that everything that you just described about stakes, I think those stakes were always there. It's just easy to ignore it when you're making good money, you live in a part of the country where you're not suffering, you know, you don't see people getting shot, killed because like they're not, you don't see it. And on and on and on and on, whatever protects us and allows us to be in denial doesn't mean that it's not there anyway. And so I'm not saying we need to vote for Trump as if like he will perpetuate that suffering. I'm like, no, he mirrors it. And I think Biden's going to make us think, woof, what a relief. We just saved the country. And my point is there is no savior, like no savior is coming. We are going to perpetually be in like the plight of what life is. And that plight is everything you just said, Vanessa, I think that will always be true no matter who's elected. But I just think Trump being in there is an easier way for us to maybe kind of sort of see it. That's the best that I've got. And I really mean that. But if there's any savior, according to you, it is the the f- flexibility and brilliance of our system that in theory can can flex and check and balance and and grow and i i guess i don't i guess i don't necessarily agree with the second half of your of the premise which is like in in four more years of trump is a vote for our system it just feels like it's being so undermined and those checks and balances are are eroding more and more and that's a good point i guess what i'm saying is and wait, wait you, I don't you, think need to, you, you need to answer. You need to answer the stor- strongest version of this argument because I think that the. Say that again. The, I didn't hear the first part. Sorry, I think that you need to answer this question. The, the strongest version of this argument, okay. which means that it's not just that it, institutions are, you know, aesthetically being. Uh, d- d- blemished right. and, uh, and and defaced by 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 the trump behavior it's not the it's not it's not character or or personality slime that is sticking to this place and it's not even just personal corruption because as we know corruption is in the nature of yeah. the beast politicians are corrupt it's not it's not unique that trump uh, and his cronies are trying to find ways to game the system to turpidly enrich themselves that's that's just part of the package of being a politician. What is special is that Trump is a person who openly pushes for broadening libel laws, openly pushing for changing any aspect of this, having a, a, a self-protecting um, enemy prosecuting attorney general. He is, he, he every single campaign rally in the past two weeks have been have included either a lock him up for biden or due to the hunter story or a lock her up for uh governor uh, gretchen whitmore of um michigan so this is actual strongman totalitarian rhetoric that he's bringing in and is in some ways actively trying to implement in his government. He is act is he pushed his attorney general to investigate Hunter Biden. It's the the the, the sort of violence to the institutions that come from the Trump circle are real. I agree. And, Listen, I concede this will this would be my first point of conceding this conversation. I concede that's an argument that really it, it gets me. Because the way I take that argument is Four more years of Trump will danger- could change the system. Yeah, right. It will normalize. It will normalize the very approach I'm trying to not just normalize. Boy, because normalize is number one. Normalize is, is is the psychological, sociological change which could happen because both by uh, Trump support Trump and his supporters and his wilder cronies being empowered. And his opponents being also, you know, driven to more extreme measures and completely eschewing any middle ground from now on. But also 
it's it's going to be consolidating the 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 the, the power of the, the, that almost mystical power that some Republicans believe Trump has because he won a second time against all odds. So the rallying behind him will be on such a different level, and his power to change the system, like I said, open libel laws, prosecute enemies, will grow, and oh, yeah. this could change the fundamentals of the American system. Plus, he will have more judges, which means there will be less checks on his power. That's a good good argument. You have me, I mean, look, I'm just silent and taking it in, but let me ask you both. And by the way, this is where it would be so fun to have like what I call... Oh, wait, I, I don't want, no, I'm not letting you off from okay. this because th- this is a, tr- a, a point. It's a question. I don't, I don't hear it as a question. I just heard it as like, why? Comment? Oh, sh- sure. You're saying that you voted for him as a check on power. If he wins, it's more likely that his power will go unchecked and that this power will be utilized in a way that will bring down some of those barriers and institutional foundations that you said are so important to you. How do you yeah. reconcile this? I don't, your question. I, I, what I, my answer to that is I just honestly, I don't believe that. I think that's, mm. I think it's exaggerated. I think it's an exaggerated. Uh, it's almost like, Trauma flashback. <laughs> it's like, it's trauma flashback. Like, we but you don't believe it that he's going to win, or you no, don't believe no, no, that no, no, no. having I mean, won, he'll be able to change to I, to have more in, impactful way in reshaping the system in his image. I think we've been so traumatized by Trump that literally we jump at every backfiring truck. It's kind of like the system's not going to be destroyed by him. He's not going to usher in the third like Reich again. It's not, he's not gonna, like, no, wait, no, no, don't, don't just don't straw man me. I don't think he'll, I don't think he's going to bring in a, a dictatorship. I don't think when I'm using, no, I'm like straw man, that, I don't think it's going to be the third Reich. And I, and, and I never subscribe to the Trump is bringing dictatorship to America narrative, but you don't have to go full dictatorship in order to change the system significantly enough to be less liberal. Yeah. If you think a Biden presidency might have that power then think what a second term of Trump with four That's years of answer. advantage can do. You, it's, 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 you know, it's a truism of, of exactly. politics that you need a few years just to get the lay of the land before you can it's actually true. like start playing, gaming the system. He has already had those four years. Okay, but here's why I, th- here's my answer. And this is where, I, you know, let's you know, prove me wrong or let's, I want to do research on it or something. But I think the reason why that isn't likely is because we have the upper hand in this country not like who's we left liberal democratic side is and has the upper hand the only real counterbalance to that now is the supreme court the president and the senate that's it and there's like there's the a, only counterbalance is yeah, all the, the, the most powerful the only the most powerful institutions in in, in so Aside from well, the God. sheer power of, of the American government, the most powerful government in the history of the world, aside for that, we're, we're, we're winning. That's what you're saying. Yes. <laughs> right. So, because, I mean, social media entertainment, for sure, left-leaning, uh, political, no. I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to constantly like understand like where where it is that you're locating the power okay. of the left. Is it in the media? Is it in the influence? Well, I'll just give a. I mean, again, this is where I really wish, like you know, again, this isn't my expertise, but I'll just give it like from like my life stuff, a fifty year sweep. The rights power, and it's more than just cultural shifts. I mean, come on, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is a testament to policy. Like she, if she were on this conversation, she wouldn't be talking about philosophy. She'd be talking about policy for every single point we brought up. But in my lifetime, the transformation of the role of the following people is staggering. Women, black men and women, gays, lesbian. We now have something called transgender and all of this. Um, that alone, I mean, let's just stop. Oh, no, 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 not, not just that alone. Economy, like this shifting from sort of corporate economics to um, entrepreneurial revolution. Like those things alone, I saw in my lifetime, and they are so radically different from what I knew from the 70s and 80s that, like, my generation, we're still kind of like astounded by it. 
So that to right there, that's just my contribution to saying that perspective is a longer lens than what like some younger millennials than you, they're just thinking, well, whoa, like you're only seeing the threat to what's happening to what you only recently have come to know and enjoy. And I'm saying, wait a minute, these are not small triumphs that have happened. And I didn't even talk about gay marriage. I mean, what? Or healthcare. I mean, what Obama did with healthcare, like all of that was so radically fast and profound and amazing that you would think if you were just listening to the narratives of the past summer, you would think that we're just like a week out of slavery and chain, <laughs> gays and women still are being like beaten after dinner every day. And some are, by the way. But I mean, it's like, that's my point in saying, and this is, again, this is where I wish like I really were a policy wonk. Because no, I but would so here's, I, I actually, I, I think that's, that's a wonderful point. And I don't know if Vanessa, I don't, do you, do you share this sentiment? Because everything that Misha said right now, I, I 100% agree with. And I, I, I really hate the kind of eschatological language that people on both sides have. And this is, this is a, a recurring theme in the, in the outskirts of political commentary where we exist to, to kind of tire of the way that both the right and the left keep talking of themselves as if they're perpetually losing. And I know. It, because because this is just an effective galvanizing strategy to constantly think exactly the right is constantly winning, we need to take back and, and conquer it, or the, the left is constantly winning and they win the culture war, blah, blah. So I agree. There is a lot of inflation, of risk inflation. Exactly. In, we're the, in the way time, that we're talking about. They're going to take our abortion away. I, mean, I, this is two I think you're right. Go. And it, it, just a just an example right now, there's a <laughs> Trump. Well, a lot of the commentary about uh, Barrett and then the way a point that the Democratic senators were trying to push is that she is posing a risk to the Affordable Care Act, to Obamacare. And realistically, she's much more likely to only be threatening the kind of like, like pushing the death knell of the um um what was it called the 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 mandate uh the something mandate yeah, the individual, the personal, the individual mandate yeah. um and we, the system is probably going to hold and and is, that's not just because she it's not clear that the court has the power right now to completely underwrite the law also because uh, it probably it's probably pretty clear that the majority of Americans do not want to touch Obamacare and you can just see it by the fact that most right. Republican contenders right now no longer say anything about repealing Obamacare this is a, this is a moot talking point so I agree with you on all that uh, the, there's an inflation in the way that the Democrats were saying oh she's going to kill Obamacare it's not impossible but it's unlikely that this is going to happen all that is true but if you in the same way that you don't want anybody who challenges you on your voting for Trump to judge you by in the lights of the worst Trump supporter, don't don't return this bad favor. <laughs> don't don't try to judge us by the lights of the most rabid Trump opponents. OK, that's, a good point. that's really good. So nothing of what I said and nothing of, of the challenges that Vanessa ra raised amounts to the point of we are. It, 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 unless I'm drunk and I'm misremembering it. it. So I, I don't think nothing is the world is going to end or... Really that we, the, well, but maybe Vanessa thinks so. Oh, I, I don't think the world is going to end and I don't think that the... Um, uh, I think that some institutions are going to just... Uh, Vanessa, uh, fill, uh, jump yeah, in. Jump, actually, right, oh, sorry. You're telling me to wait? Or can you, I jump you know, in? Just, just jump in in a second. I just want to finish okay. this point. Um, I... Uh, and, and remember what you're going to say because I'm actually super interested. The... The, the the thing that bugs me is that I am genuinely worried. Since I don't think the world is going to end, I think there is going to be real damage, and I think that you can have a lot of real damage institutionally to to the United States, to foreign relations, and long term for things like climate change and and uh, big issues that I deeply care about, and not, not to mention partisanship. That will be exacerbated for the worst under a Trump presidency, all that can be possible, and in my opinion, likely, without being the worst case scenario that is being presented by some people. So don't judge us by the, 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 the worst thing. apocalyptic visions that some people um, 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 paddle. I'm, I was very specific really in the concerns of my, and, and I still I don't think I've heard a, a satisfying response, but uh, Vanessa, go ahead. 
I mean, now to, to unfortunately play into your hands a little bit here, but like the, the, the very first thing that I thought about Misha, when, when we, when you, you know, <laughs> came out to us as it were. <laughs> uh, because I've spent the weekend talking to my partner about this, like trying to like wrap our heads around like how how are people feeling right now about about their vote and and I'm trying to like trying to understand it because it's really hard for us and because for for me and I, I guess I'm going to put myself in the in the position of a little extremist here, but I do think that the stakes when you're especially when you're talking about climate change could be catastrophic i do think that four more years of trump could be catastrophic for the planet and for for a lot millions of people on this planet even just specifically talking about climate change and nothing else uh and so for me it's really hard to understand like if if people on the left are feeling like this vote the stakes are so high it is it is actually you know, end of the world type decision. It's really hard for me to understand how someone who believes in climate change could make a vote because everything else that could potentially happen doesn't feel nearly as high stakes. Yeah, as, I, agree, as I, agree that. I agree with you. I, I so here's a, it still fits with my, I don't know, meta philosophy, which is if that is true, which I'm with you, I actually think it is true and scary and pending. If that's true, then there's only one thing for us to do. We now nah, we're not going to do it because we're, vote for people who put science no, and climate concerns no. on their agenda. Well, you could agenda. do that. You, you could do that, but guess what? We don't have the numbers. I and mean, that's the other thing. I'm a pragmatist too. It's kind of well, like we don't have the numbers because people are voting on on symbolic reasons. Right, but check it out. If you don't have the numbers, what you do. It goes back to my politics of friendship. If you don't have the numbers, what Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer must do is you must make friends with those who actually have the power and trump is the easiest of all because or all or you, or you can gain the power no 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 no. now you're Wait, avoiding the argument no no you're avoiding the argument because the, we're not asking about what to do when you're in a minority and i agree with you this is the only way to to build a coalition when you are in a minority but if we are taking it seriously as a, a world-breaking possibility, a yeah. world-ending possibility. And I, I have a response to this to, to, I actually don't think that voting for Trump is the end of the world in terms of climate change, though I take climate change very seriously. I'll, I'll explain that in a second. But if we do assume that this is the case and that a Republican government will be the end, like will mean the end of the world, then you can... Sure, if there is a Republican government, it is incumbent on people on the left to to take their position seriously and no, uh, like, like cater to power a little bit, pander to Trump and, and do whatever they need to do in order to get him on board true. the climate train. But before that, during voting, you can also not vote for him if you take it seriously. No, I think, I, look, I think it's true, but I think you're missing my point. My point is, I think it's irrelevant. Like, you know, I'm drawing upon the psychology of it. Like I'm trying to apply human psychology to soci soci social politics. And what I'm saying is it doesn't matter. Like I think what Vanessa says is possible, but to me, it doesn't matter whether the world's going to end under the stupidity of Trump or under some other accident under, you know, uh, Kamala Harris or something. Like it doesn't matter to me. What I'm saying is sooner or later, some crisis, some opportunity might be embraced by us as a time to come together and collaborate our way out of the world problems rather than thinking that the winning and losing of politics is our method. That's what I'm saying. So I, it really doesn't matter. Again, like, I agree with you. I agree with you in theory. And to Vanessa's point, I the reason I don't see the Trump election as cataclysmic, I think it is will be cataclysmic for American environmentalism. I think former years of Trump holding the EPA would be devastating for... Uh, national parks. It will be devastating for air quality potentially you in certain places. Um, I I don't. I think in terms of climate change, the the cha the the difference it will make for years of Trump are s s inferior to what you know. America is still not the 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 world's greatest polluter, and the where the biggest changes need to come are actually on the international stage. And I think it's a loss that the United States is not involved in trying to force other countries to, to play ball. And mm -hmm. that is a, a damage. But I, I, I think the bigger um, um, front is the European Union fighting against China and India and trying to find a balance there. I don't think the, the Trump is the decisive blow in this case. That's my assessment. That's why I don't think it's necessarily mm -hmm. the, you know. But when they do this, like, like, 
if if what Vanessa is saying is true, then Misha Thomas's little vote in New York of all places is hardly that big of a deal. So obviously it's not about me and my vote. It's about the principal, but I get that. Right. But my point is, if what she says is so serious. No, no, but even we can't even eliminate that because you said that you would st still vote for Trump would, if you were in Bucks County. And in Bucks no, County, indeed. in Bucks County, you would be part of the, uh, to use the words of our previous me. guest, you would be part of the selectorate that actually yes, ends up why? changing the world. It wouldn't make me a hero though, because I think the we, the people, we're in a sense the least... I mean, if you really look at it, we're, 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 we're the least significant in a representative form of government. In other words, like Vanessa, like what she said does stir me up. I'm thinking, wow, this is serious. But wait a minute. Our elected officials don't seem to be as worried as you are. You know why? Because they're still freaking fighting. When I see Cortez and Schumer and Pelosi role model to us what the three of us are role modeling here then I will have some belief. But right now, I mean, do you hear my own cynicism? It's my cynicism and my pessimism is that I'm, I keep rallying what I know and what I believe in, which is a politics of friendship, capitulation, meeting halfway, because no matter who's in there, they're incomplete and they're, they're fallible by definition. And so the harder the stakes are, the more my politics of friendship becomes relevant. So one one thing I want to see if if you have an answer to is like because because clearly I think that a, a another Trump term could be catastrophic. But do you think that four years of Biden would be if potentially catastrophic? No, for our I, country? Don't, I don't because what what I'll do then is <laughs> I'll be saying this to my friends on the right and I'll say calm down although i never say calm down but the gist of <laughs> the gist of my subtext will be calm down it's not really that bad let's be friends with them look all of these people are my best friends they're really great you know what I mean? like i'll be doing the same thing but on the other side and then i'll be saying to the gop stop it you've got to like like i'll just say the left is just traumatized we're upset like we're just it's all backlash you've got, and i'd be saying the same thing i'm saying about friendship but i think the problem is I mean, I don't know the problem. This is just my contribution from my field of experience and interest. I think we need some kind of cultural shift. And by the way, it's happening. Like, I mean, I think the millennials and the generation after that, you guys are like a loving generation. Like you embody- Are we? The, are we? Yeah, the generation I after that? So. You, you just, you read the, the cuddling of the American mind. You read the, <laughs> how, yeah. how could you- how can you well, lay such the wild the, claims? No, the, well, the problem, okay, that's the problem. The problem with the millennials and younger is that they think that they're too fragile, they're overly pampered, and they lack the sort of grit that my generation wants. But we did that to them. But what they have in exchange is what were, was needed here. And the exchange is a real love and orientation with humanity. And that's, I mean, that's why they're called snowflake. Oh, snowflake, snowflake. But I think that's actually what we need. It's just that it needs to be better integrated with this, you know, toughness that I'm talking about. But I really, in this context, believe me, in this context, I think the millennials will save the world in a way because we've got to have a, God, I'm going to use that horrible word that everyone uses, paradigm shift. Like we have to have this shift where collaboration becomes sexy. Like collaboration has to be the new, you know, the new entertainment or else we are going to freaking destroy this planet. Even like to, we're going to destroy ourselves. It's like I completely agree with you in every step of the way. I just cannot see how a Trump presidency will accomplish any it of won't. it. It won't. It won't. But the Trump presidency isn't the be all end all in my world philosophy. Oh, no, I agree. So I, I agree with that. It obviously, like I, But it's, it's, it, it is, I, I'm, you know, I'm I'm somewhere between the two of you in terms of how damaging uh, Trump presidency will be. I think it will, as, as I said, I've spoken enough about this. I guess I just don't where where we part ways most profoundly. I think is in seeing voting as an act of cultural statement. I just don't agree with that. I just can't. I, you know, it's not just cultural for me. It's policy as well. Like. The Supreme Court, I think, is the biggest power that he had already, and it's done. Like, if he doesn't win again, he's already done a good thing by getting the, all those conservatives in there. And Which I say you think is a good thing. I do think it's a good Which thing. Which I, well, right, right. And I uh, will. And by the way, the Electoral College, that's the other thing I should have mentioned. I'm terrified 
that wait, so wait, 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 wait. No, no, Supreme Court. If you're saying that the Supreme Court is a good thing and you've already done it again, so why course. vote for him? Yeah, I, I mean, the fact that the Supreme Court has a very strong and powerful conservative presence there. And by the way, the lower courts, he packed those lower and courts. Again, I, I can't, sorry, I'm, 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 so, I'm, I'm losing you again. It's so confusing to me because you're saying- but I also you, want to know you're what you're say- saying about electoral college because I think what Misha is saying is that we, we, if we don't have some sort of way of having to pay attention to people- yes. In, in rural countries and who are right leaning, we're they're, they're, we're going to completely steamroll them. So in, in a way, I think he's just saying that a, a right leaning Supreme Court and the Electoral College is actually what we need to make sure that we don't leave them behind. Oh my gosh, she's the best summarize. You summarize better than anyone I know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so here's the bullshit. That's here's the, here's, okay. here's why it's bullshit. That's it. No, here's why it's bullshit. So um, the first of all, you you said uh, that. It's about checking power. Again, we are talking about the courts are, are set in one direction. The, the, the Senate, if Trump gets elected, will 100% be Republican. And, yes. the, and, and the House may be Demo- kept by Democrats. So who are you keep guarding against? Who, who is voting for Trump guarding against in the ideal? Again, your vote doesn't matter, but in theory, who does it guard against? And second, what... Sure. The I I I don't I'm not I don't have a clear position about the, the the electoral college. I think there is there is room for reform there. I think that the fact that you have fifty yeah, thousand pe- I think that the fact that you have fifty thousand people, fifty thousand voters, who end up being able to stake the to to set the direction for three hundred million, that it's all ends up being only fifty to a hundred thousand people. Who, who decide the exactly. fate of 300. This is not this, but this is their electoral college, Misha. This is what the electoral college has engendered. We have no, 50 no. to a hundred thousand people whose vote matters. And the rest are, you could say that they're not left behind, but they're not le- left behind because, sorry, they're not ahead because the politics favors them. They're ahead because they are urbanites, elites who have, have their own circles. And that's a different problem. But the electoral college, what it guarantees is that the American Republic has to listen to about 100,000 people instead of 300 million. Well, instead of or altogether? Of, no, instead of. Because as, like I've said before, don't, don't, Trump has ignored California. Trump ignores New York. Trump ignores any place that is not part of the winning coalition, again, to use the, uh, the language of our, our friends from the previous podcast, People who are not in the winning coalition and the winning coalition because of the way that the system is right now through the electoral college is narrowed to 50 to 100,000 people whose vote counts. The rest are foregone conclusions and therefore do not need to be courted. You know, you don't need to show any concern for them. And if you have a president whose character is the fulfillment of the political science imperative to only act insofar as you expend the interests of your supporters, then you're going to get a lot of effective disenfranchisement. Yeah. And that's what, you, that's what the, the, the glorious uh, electoral college gets us. I understand the concern. I understand the need to well, balance. the popular vote is going to eradicate that? What? I mean, will the popular vote abrogate the possibility of imbalance no i don't think that the, you, you i don't think that's a solution personally i don't think that the solution is completely abolishing the electoral college oh, good, clear, okay. I, I think that you do need some balancing and I, I think but i think part of the balancing already exists in the senate the senate is a balancing act already I, I will flag that we've got i've got a drop off in five minutes so um so i don't want to like i want to make sure that we have a chance to wrap up this this conversation because yeah. yeah, this was this this was a crazy this was not at all what i expected this conversation was going to be this is this was like shocking but (laughs) but also great uh interesting (laughs) there's so many adjectives i could just throw out at this but like this, this was not the, co- the, co- the call or the conversation that I thought we no were this was not what I sold to anybody I was like hey Misha no. did, can, can you get in a call we just want to try the start, I mean, no, like I shooting was, the shit a little bit about the election and then okay. Vanessa is like 
hey, do you mind stop <laughs> stopping your exercise and join? I was like, I literally had like a dumbbell in my hand when Adam was like, let's talk to Misha. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess I'll put this down and pick up my intellectual dumbbell instead. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, well, how do you feel, Misha? I mean, like, this is, this is a pretty. How does it feel so coming cool. out? How does it feel? Yeah. How does it feel? It feels so great. No, I feel heard and loved and understood. But you know what? I, experientially, I'm like, yes, this is, but by the way, I mean, this is the story of our, like, inner circle of friendship. Like, we experience firsthand this idea of debate, difference, disagreement as safe process. And, like, I learn from it, but it's just, it's like, it's a good reference point. It's like, it's our way of, like, we could say to people and know that we're telling the truth when we say, it is possible to have an in the moment, you don't have to have everything worked out, safe conversation where you're really sort of struggling together. And so anyway, I feel grateful for that, but I'm taking notes too, because, you know, my question is, is there a way to turn the insights and fun of this conversation into something that can be taught and modeled and practiced and incorporated into actual, I don't know, policy, education. I, I will say that this is, for me, the most important thing about having this uh, podcast, blog, whatever whatever we're doing, is really encourage, like, like you said, modeling this kind of conversations. And, you know, I couldn't have asked for a better intro than you, you just coming out with your Trump. So, like I was worried uh, we're just going to talk about how how stressful I know, it's this is. like it's going to be boring it's going to be boring I said, oh, okay cool Misha Misha voted for Trump cool and and this is it just is really wonderful and I I really do profoundly um disagree with your conclusion <laughs> Yeah, well, hey, no, we, no we, and and not just just Vanessa just, just, already voted, <laughs> so that she's not she can't change her. I am not persuaded. I um, wasn't either. I, I'm, I I think you are wrong, and oh, and wow. also also I am not one hundred percent convinced that you would end up. I, I I'm pretty convinced that you would never have voted for Biden. I'm not convinced that you wouldn't have either either did a write in or voted for I don't know, a libertarian candidate. I know. Um, in, in if you felt that your vote mattered, yeah, that, that's that, that's me psychoanalyzing you. So I don't know, and it's not fair because you said that you would still vote for Trump, and I, res hey, and I, I respect your self testimony. Well, I mean, it's easy to say that, but it's I mean, there. Hey, to fit in the theme, the uncertainty persists in a certain way. Like you know, like. There's a certain, and I think the uncertainty in this context, I'm coming to appreciate a little bit. This is uncertainty in the sense that we're still in the game. Like we're still learning. We're still open, you know? So mm -hmm. I, one more thing I want to say about yesterday. Just like no, but be, just before yesterday, I do want to live. I also, I actually have to go. I have a call at seven. By, I can be a little late, but. Um, I, I just, just uh, I do want to just in the, on the record one last time because even though it's a recurring thing, no, I, I don't need it. Let, finish up, Misa. No, I, I I'm all logged enough about this. I just I I think that the it's just a, a trigger point for me the conflation of culture and policy. No, that's a good. And I'll, and I, if anything, when this is I guess where I most profoundly disagree with you, I despise the current mode of thinking where voting counts for taking a cultural stand and vice versa. I yeah, think that there is, there are battles to wage on the cultural stage. There are battles to wage on the policy political stage. And I think they're both important. I, like I said, I think it was, it's, it's, it's very supercilious uh, to say that the, the cancel culture isn't an issue. I, in my opinion, I think that yeah, and yeah, I, yeah. I, I hate this argument. I think it's wrong. I think to to say like oh worry only about uh, climate change and the poor and don't worry about uh, the, the the growing tendency to to eliminate uh, diversity of views, that's that's insane. I think that's unhealthy and 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 ultimately self defeating. I also think it's self defeating to say that because there are some horrible cultural tendencies on one side even though policy-wise you agree with it, then voting against it is the solution. I don't think that's necessarily... I, I think that there is an incoherence there. And I think that you're... And from just know, from knowing you from our conversations, I feel like that, that the cultural behaviors and the cultural pathologies on the left have pushed you to make a 
policy statement because voting is a policy. It's not a cultural mm -hmm. sta stance. That I mean, is, is, in my I view, is incoherent with with I, with, I will, with the values that you are uh, purporting to uphold. Me, you're going to make me think about that, but I'll say. But I, I might be. I, I need to think I about it too. That, by the way, what's interesting is I I'm borrowing the same kind of argument, although I wasn't using culture. I was using uh, character and morality, for example. Like I'm. I'm I think that's culture. I think that reigns within the the majesty oh, of culture. So we so we agree. It's just that I wasn't applying maybe all of it. Like my. Cultural... I'm gonna I'm gonna drop off, guys. I'm gonna stop recording on my end. Cheers. Now, so, sorry for ruining your evening, Vanessa. Sorry, Vanessa. No, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Thank okay. you, guys. Bye. So yeah, so where I, you know, in a way that was my argument to my sister, you know, I was saying, hey, I'm not using the election as a referendum on character and morality. I'm voting a simple little thing around policy, although I didn't use the word policy, but that's kind of my point. Like, they, like I'm forcing myself to erase all of the deplorable reasons, the hundreds of reasons. No, right, right. But the thing, but what you call policy, I still think falls within culture. But again, I, I, this is now, now we're really litigating that 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 same point. That's that's where. So here's I think we what disagree. I wanted to say about yesterday. It was just so, and it's a very short statement. It's just like I want to say it. No, take your time. We're not. It was so. I don't know the word. It was amazing, exhilarating, like. I was part of this. Now, of course, it's national, but it was very New York City. I'm in uptown New York City with literally hundreds of people stretched across two polling sites that are just like, you know, a street away and in line for a couple of hours. Like, you know, obviously at me, I'm going to be best friends with a couple behind me by the time we get around. And there was just a feeling. I mean, it's just a feeling because we weren't interviewing people. But it seemed like a pretty clear, overwhelming feeling that this wasn't just any old election. This was a movement. It's a movement to take our country back against Trump. You know what I mean? That was like that was the overwhelming sort of presumptive feeling. And it was surreal for me to somehow like affirm that and be part of it while secretly knowing they have no idea that I'm voting for this guy. It was surreal. And then afterwards, I talked to an African-American friend of mine who lives in the building. And when I told him I voted for Trump, he was like, oh, did you? He said, I'm undecided. And I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? And, he, and then he started coming out about his being undecided. And I just thought, wow, it's just like, it's, I don't know. It was a surreal day. It was really, it was unbelievable. Well, <laughs> it's not impossible. Not completely impossible that New York will shock us all, and you know, maybe, maybe, maybe because of you, Trump will carry <laughs> New York as well. Uh, money. <laughs> I I will not be in favor of this outcome. Put it this way, for the reasons no. I've stated. But at I, least we'll still be friends. Yes, I I will blame you for every <laughs> horrible thing that will happen in the Trump presidency <laughs> in the second term, um, and when the a conservative majority Supreme Court ends up <laughs> bringing down every like civil rights achievement of the past 60 years. I every know. Every relic of social success. You have me on the right. <laughs> well, I will like say, oh, enjoy. Enjoy the country that you yeah, have man. wrought. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, we shall see. You know, it's, it's, it's difficult because your motivations I obviously share. And agree that we're in a moment culturally and socially that encourages people to to assume the worst about each other and entrench themselves in paranoid perspectives and thinking without even allowing for the option that their neighbors are not out to get them or their neighbors are not out to completely eradicating their lifestyles and, and, and their world. And this is something that the left does that. The right does that. The right was so obsessed with the war on Christmas. Yeah, so, I know. You know, nobody cares. Nobody ever came for anybody's Christmas, except for in the fantasies of, you know, the Bill O'Reilly's of the world. This is, this is, it's, it's a paranoid country. It's a, and it's a paranoid politics and it's it has been exacerbated and i agree that the effects of it go beyond 
just having a really disgusting Twitter conversation. I think we are seeing the total degeneration of social solidarity and an openness, a tolerance to violence, a tolerance to cultural and social warfare because of this pervasive paranoia. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because the more you believe that your neighbor wants to destroy you and what you care about, the more you're willing to actually destroy them. Yeah. And so yeah. this is, it's a terrible moment that we're in, in that regard. The, the, the collapse of old modes of communication and the fact that we are all cooped up in our apartments without being able to see faces and, and empathize with, with people that we don't necessarily agree with ideologically yeah is making everything all like so much worse and we the demonizing yeah. and vilifying everyone is is just just too easy and why not do that it's it's just it, it gives you a, a point of catharsis to discharge all of this anger and frustration and 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 you know whether it's the economic anxiety that the Times used to write about or cultural apoplexia. It's just, it's so satisfying to just be able to discharge it against a person who, for you, embodies all this evil that, that you fear is trying to destroy you. So all that, I, I agree with. And I, th I think we're on the same page. Yeah, and I mean... I just don't see how yeah. Trump is in any way, not, not just Trump the person, but a Trump presidency will in any way change, like move the needle in a positive direction for more self-reflection. You know, it's, like, it's not that I'm it's, thinking that Biden will. I no, think that, no, I, I get that. It's like this, you know, I go back to like, there's one other, I mean, it's interesting, you know, Vanessa's reflection about like sort of ennobling suffering was kind of like, oh my gosh, that's so chilling. It's like, it's way too like religious, <laughs> by religious inner psychology or something. But I will say, excuse me, at least to capture it. Like, I don't know if, there, if there's like, perhaps if there's any sort of heroic or an attempt at a heroic gesture, it may be a little more strategic and foresightful than, you know, I'm admitting, like, in other words, I want to be able to say, as I know I'm going to have to, that I practice what I'm preaching to the next group of people that cannot accept an outcome that they don't want. Like in other words, I'll be able to say, look, I hated Trump. I wept that he was president, but I was able to adjust to him and actually even vote for him. You do the same for Biden and Harris now. <laughs> yes, I am sure that will change hearts. <laughs> well, it may not, but at least I'll be true to be able to say it. <laughs> So, hey, really? thanks for asking the question, although I could not believe that was your first question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad, you know. I couldn't even hide. I couldn't even hide. Like, I was hoping that I would sort of maybe slip it in midway and say, oh, by the way, that's your freaking first question. I was like, oh, shit, how do I dance around this one? <laughs> you know, I there was, for amazing. a while, I was not going to ask it. Like, in my mind, for a while, I mean, like, 20 seconds when I was deciding how to start the conversation. And I thought, may I leave that for later? Like, start with something more. I don't remember. I don't even remember what I had in mind. I'm so glad we didn't I'm waste so any glad time. You didn't I, I'm is, so glad you didn't help me with this. Um, yeah, time efficiency. You know, I, I'm trying to find ways to, to sympathize with your decision. And, and to, by your logic, I still can't. I, 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 was, I, I, I really wanted to be able to say, at the end of the day, I understand where you're coming from. And like, I understand where you're coming from. I just don't understand the final step that you made. I don't think, I it's, don't think it's harmful or detrimental. I, I certainly don't think that it's dishonorable in any way. Uh, I just can't, I can't follow the, 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 the logical strain there. That's okay. Like, I think that's part of the beauty of it. Like you almost don't have to like, like the challenge. You know, no, but the reason that I want to, or to either either convince myself that I can understand, or convince you that you're wrong, <laughs> the reason why this still matters to me is because I don't want voting. You know, earlier, like not that early, but a few moments ago, I said I I worry about voting becoming, a, staking a cultural statement. Um, 
it's more than I'm than that that I'm worried about voting becoming just another way in which Americans exercise their self validation or self therapy. I want politics to be as separate from um from personal like meaning search meaning I searchy so feely that. Wait, places you, then you hear me saying that though, right? I mean, you know, I, that's, I mean, my first statement was meant. I mean, I actually love what you're saying. I'm taking good notes. No, like, but you're saying you're saying it's separated from Trump's character and personality. I think, but I think that yeah. in 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 exchange, you've turned it into being too tied up with your own self reflection and and search for validation. You did that to assert. your place as a yeah, cultural moderator as yeah, as as a centrist as an anti radical uh, radicalist you you in in a way you put aside said i'm not you know i, I know that you're much more well read yeah, than right. most the most Americans and yet you said i'm not i don't understand policy i'm not think i don't think about policy which obviously is false because you do and you you you're much Why more you know, the intricacies i mean no i know but in, in, just in effect to the in, no no i understand I'm i understand you, but that. you in effect said that your 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 thought process in regards to the current cultural tensions that we were living through guided you more than any specific policy or any specific yeah, that's true. Rep- responsibility that, that the president is supposed to be in charge of. It's so true. And so, so t- I can't help but see it as Misha finding a way to, or ha- feeling the need to assert his Misha-ness and his that's, I, look, that's so philosophical cool. through voting. <laughs> when, while I, and while I think the Misha-ness is wonderful, And you know, maybe through this I follow it. I follow maybe it. Maybe listeners will agree with like, it, but it will maybe it will make a difference if people hear and and you know take it to mind and end up de you know de-escalating the the political warfare. But what I don't like is voting becoming a tool for that. It's fine. It's in the game. There, nobody tells you what should guide you when you vote. No, I like it. I, I like just it. don't like it. I am very it's, much in, in the school of, if you don't have any, if, you, if you're not politically minded, if you're not policy minded, then maybe, maybe voting, but maybe you should like wait this one out if you don't have a policy focus. <laughs> hey, this goes back. Oh my gosh, it's so funny. All roads lead to your elitism around voting. <laughs> And it's true. I guess. <laughs> But it's kind of like, hey, I like it. Like, I feel like, gosh, I do want you, like my goal for your retirement career is to end up as a professor. But like, I think you'd be an amazing poli-sci prof because, you know, I feel the inspiration of like youth in me right now. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, it would be so fun. Like, let's say like, if I just heard this as your lecture, next semester, I would totally be like reading these books that I have on my shelf that I still haven't read about, you know, the German ideology, Marxism and beyond, you know, it's like it, what you say actually does not turn me off. It intrigues me about wanting to educate myself more around policy for the reasons that you're giving, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. And I think that's kind of what's missing in education. Like make the challenges a impetus for, you know, taking on a study because it's fun to do it that way. Like it's a context that Is not lost on me so yeah i the feedback's kind of amazing i it's great to hear well we'll <laughs> reconvene after an, a new president is yeah announced presumably assuming that it's going to happen in the next month which is not guaranteed unfortunately so hey i can't thank you enough thanks for asking I, the question no th- so, thanks for listening thank you for being so open um and also i kind of find it terrifying and terrible that you felt that you needed to think twice about being I know about isn't this. it something yeah isn't it something isn't it? I yeah I I mean I understand concerns when you really are talking about real fascists and you know the fact that for a lot of Americans there is a belief that most Trump supporters are motivated by crypto fascism and therefore should be ashamed yeah. of their vote is insane to me You know, you have two halves of the country and the, 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 their view of each other is, is so, not to say disingenuous, but I, I'd say just deranged. It's just, it's, 
tragic. Well, that's the biggest thing I'm taking. To be honest, I think at least now, I mean, there's so many of the things I'll reflect on, especially to listen back to it. But right now, the biggest thing I'm taking away that's like a precious little stone, I'm like, wow, I think it's really good feedback that you give to me to be careful not to assign to the left what I'm guarding against toward the right. Like, I do appreciate that. And you know, you know what it reminds me of? It's so funny. I keep going back to like my coming out experience when I was coming out and I was like, you know, really reorienting myself to like the self empowerment and stuff. I remember a good friend of mine, she was a clinician. She said to me, like when I was talking about my parents as basically being wrong, she said, but listen to you, like you're doing to them what you don't want them to do to you. And I was like, oh, but they're wrong. And she's like, but that's what they think about you. And it was like, whoa, like she gave me a way of thinking about coming out where I had to not assign my most extreme fear about people that were stunned by it. And so anyway, you did that for me in terms of this. And it's like, oh, that's a good guide, you know, because what I think I'm going to, what I'm going to do, I'm going to say it as a commitment. I'm committed to working really hard to let people be shocked and have reactions and sort of tear at what they think is my, you know, I think they deserve me listening to them the way I wanted to be listened and what I did. So you help me, you help cue me into that. But the only, so here's the only assignment that I want, like the only project, like, so like if, if we look at some of these things as, oh, Adam, these would be great follow-up projects. Here's the follow-up project I would want to propose given what I'm taking. Literally, I'm taking and learning something from what you just said. Here's my project. Now, of course, when I say project, I'm really talking about a problem, right? Because we're, there's a problem here. The problem that I have is how do we get... Okay, so Biden wins. And this will be good in terms of your, um, in terms of policy. Better, we, not necessarily good, but yes. Okay, better. That's fine. Here's my problem. What really matters to me, and I think you'll see this fits with everything I've been saying. I don't care if the masses accidentally pick the person that meets your criteria. I think we all need to learn how to go back to Neil Postman's idea of the typographical thinking. We need to be able to do what you did, you did the hard work of reading and thinking and processing complicated things, but that doesn't take the masses off the hook. Let's all take a little more time to have at least internal dialogues, like what you did in those three and a half minutes to articulate your criteria for thinking through a decision, because that matters too. We just can't accidentally make the right decision for the wrong reasons. <laughs> I think it's important to try to teach to integrate both. Well, we agree. Or, but, but nor can you make the wrong decision for the right reasons. That's true. Although I hope that's not what I'm doing, but I'm, I'm humble enough to say that that could be the case. And I wouldn't say that you've changed my mind against my vote. You've just expanded my thinking and I learned something from it. And that's what I want. So thank you. Like I said, if he's elected, I, I will, I will <laughs> make your life a living nightmare. So <laughs> Some, something to look forward to. Indeed. I should go because yes, I've got to. And you, you remember, you do owe me a cocktail, a fancy one. Yeah. Hey, it's going to be my Pinot Noir since that's my new thing. <laughs> Pinot Noir? Yes. Well, you've moved from rosé to like you, you're, you're darkening. It's my whole, it's the whole heart health thing. It's been so fun. Ah. Oh, you, you, you didn't read uh, Good Letters yet. Not, not yet. Aha, that's why. Oh, you'll understand that quote after you read that. I, I shall. Well, Misha, you know thank you. Hey, maybe read it over a glass of wine. Just saying. Oh, I, I just, uh, well, in, in full disclosure, I finished a full bottle of wine while talking to you. It wasn't a Pinot Noir, oh, I think. Oh, well, good. Well, you're ready to just read it, it was, then. It's in chocolate. Uh, it was, um, uh, I can't see what it is, but it's 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 it's, it's a cheap wine. It, it's, it was the wine that cost less than $10, and that's what well, I Well, mean. what's funny about me saying what I'm about to say now is one of my favorite dates ever, let alone that with you, was our wine date that we did, which, by the way, I was finally using my 50th birthday party gift before it expired. And how fun was that? Oh, that was lovely. And 
So I want more of that now that I'm learning wine. Like I'm actually really learning wine and I'm so excited. Like, oh my goodness, it is worth kind of learning a little bit. It's like anything. Once you start studying it, you can enjoy it in newer ways. Well, I really hope that whoever wins the election, we can, (laughs) whatever happens, my hope is that things magically can be done, like that the, like the Neil Ferguson, the false argument, the, 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 the pressure will be released and we can... You know, dial back a bit in, in how much of our attention span is devoted to politics. And hopefully this will happen. Yeah, I hope he's right and too. <laughs> when that happens, uh, you know, he was, like I said, he was already wrong. <laughs> but who oh, maybe, maybe, maybe second time. That's what I mean. Second time. Uh, I mean, second, maybe. So second time's maybe. the charm. I, I hope, but either way, we should do a wine geekery special on this oh, podcast totally. and we'll, we'll, we'll just bore everyone with that. Well, and Vanessa, but Vanessa already volunteered her father, whom you know is like expert sommelier. So oh yes. Like, yeah, well, hey. that's the whole, well, we'll get there. Misha, thank you so much. Thank you for you right. being so open and we will do another one of those dispatches after the election. Can't wait. Good luck. All right. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you for, uh, listening to uncertain things. Um, that was a surprising one. Um, and, and thank you for sticking all the way through, which you have, if you're hearing this, please subscribe to uncertain.substack.com and wherever you get your podcast and do give us a really good five-star rating because we'd really love to create more of these crazy conversations, which we think are valuable. So anyway, thanks for sticking. Stay sane. Good night.